so undeserving of what you've done for us for sending your son to earth to take the ultimate sacrifice and dying on the cross and shedding his blood for us. Father God, I'm so thankful every day that I get to live in creation knowing I'm forgiven. I am loved. I am valued. I am worth more than rubies and and jewels. God, I'm I'm just so overwhelmed with the emotions and um, the love that it took for you to send your son to die for us. God, I pray that as we go into our time of learning from your word, that you would just open our hearts and minds. God, I don't know where each of us are walking in, what we're dealing with through our day-to-day -day lives, but God, I pray that we would just leave it all at the altar this morning so we can focus on you, God. We love you and we thank you so much for today. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to give you guys just a little uh, praise before we uh, dig into God's Word. Um, just because I want to encourage you um, with uh, your work in the world, maybe I should put it that way, and, and that it does bear fruit and make a difference, is um, we have a, a guest with us today, and, and I'm not going to put him on the spot, but I just want to tell you... Um, how that all came about and it just really encouraged me this morning is uh, as you guys know I work a, a, a part-time job um, in addition to being the pastor here and um, um, I, I, I was uh, unloading some fertilizer and uh, just got to talking to a gentleman at, uh, at Lowe's and uh, just through the course of our conversation I came to realize that he's a believer so we kind of struck up a conversation and just were talking about the Lord and that kind of stuff, you know, having uh, mutual beliefs as brothers in the Lord. And um, so I decided I'd give him my card and invite him to New Day Fellowship. And uh, a couple of weeks later, he came to church. That's how you do it, guys. You just be a believer, just share your faith, just be who you are, who God's called you to be in everyday life. That's the way the kingdom grows. And everybody can do it. Don't tell me that that's not my personality or that's just not who I am or I'm afraid or whatever. You can overcome that with Christ. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And the Great Commission is for all of us, not just for those who it fits their personality. It's for all of us. So be encouraged as you go out and share Christ with people, invite them to church, let them know you're a Christian. It does make a difference. All right. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me. And uh, I want to look first at verses 22 to 24. Then I want to jump over to chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. All right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me see if I can get my stand set up here where I know what I'm doing. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24, the Apostle Paul writing to believers at Corinth. All right, beginning with verse 22. Paul says this, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now jump over to chapter 2, and let's look at verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to look at it a little bit further down in chapter 2 as we go, but let's look at verses 1 and 2 first. He goes on to say, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I, I've been praying lately about how we're going to reach the world. Because I, I, I have felt pretty inadequate in reaching the world for Jesus Christ. And uh, I think, I, 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 if I remember correctly, I once even heard Billy Graham say the same thing. And so if Billy Graham felt like he wasn't really reaching the world, I'm in big trouble, you know. But uh, 
Um, so I've just been praying. I said, like, Lord, what is it going to take to reach people for you these days? Because, man, just people just don't want to have anything to do with God. They look at you like you have three eyes when you invite them to church and stuff. And, and um, here's what I feel like God's been telling me. All right? I feel like God's been telling me, just preach the gospel. Um, Christ crucified and raised again. That has the power to change the world. You know, it's not um, cleverly contrived sermons and, and catchy titles and fancy buildings or theatrical um, musical productions. And it's not even telling people about all the blessings that come as a believer. And, and, and not that we shouldn't do that. But what's really going to change the world, guys, is just simply preaching the gospel. Christ crucified and raised again. And, and, and how much more relevant to, than to realize that as we enter into, you know, the heart of the Easter season. Um, and it, it's, the, it's the, the power of the gospel that will do it. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze. Um, that will do it, and yet... Here's what I'm afraid um, the church has done. Here's what I'm afraid that what we have put our faith in to change the world. And it hasn't worked. And here's the reason I know it hasn't worked is because the world's not changing. All right. So let me just give you um, kind of an overview of some of the things that have taken place in the life of the church over at least the last maybe 30 years. And despite all of the various efforts, we still find ourselves in the place that we do today with a world that is lost, dying, spinning out of control without Jesus Christ. All right? And listen to some of this. Um, and, and, well, before I say this, don't throw anything at me um, in here or online. Don't, don't go running at your, your computer screens or your phones until I'm done. Okay? Until I'm done. All right, because you got to hear where I'm coming from. Let me just start off with um, uh, the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement was very strong in the church for a while, and it's still very strong in a lot of places. And, and, and the charismatic movement, in, in many ways, was focused on um, emotion and miraculous spiritual gifts. Okay? Now, again, just hold on till I'm done before you, you get upset by anything. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on the toes of a whole lot of people this morning, okay? But you'll see where I'm coming from. Then we had the seeker movement. Anybody remember what the seeker movement was all about? That was basically, let's create church services that are non-offensive. Basically, non-offensive Christianity. All right, and here's what a lot of churches did. They started removing religious icons um, out of the church. They started removing crosses. They started taking, um, you know, secular music and putting Christian lyrics to it. And, of course, that's what many hymns were. You know, they were barroom songs that they put Christian lyrics to, if you didn't know that. They, that's what that is. And I'm not even saying that's necessarily bad. But the whole seeker movement was, let's reach the lost by making sure that we make Christianity non-offensive. Well, I'm sorry, but the Christ is, is, is an offense. All right, he said, I came as a stumbling block to the wise. So that's just a reality, all right? Christ is, is offensive to many people, especially those that do not want the truth. Then we went into the, church, the, the mega church movement, you know, with all of the high-tech computers and the glitz and the glam and the theatrics and all those kinds of things. And, you know, just thousands of people flocked to these huge auditoriums and, you know, it kind of became a place where people could just blend into the crowd and hide, you know, and, and have no accountability, not have to volunteer or serve or anything because they just got lost in the crowd and they thought they were doing God a favor because they showed up on Sunday morning. Then you got into the prosperity movement, you know, where I always to refer to it as the uh, name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it movement, you know, where it's like if I just have enough faith, I can have anything. You know, even a Cadillac in my garage. I actually heard a, a pastor on TV once, and I actually liked the, the pastor. He, he had a lot of good teachings. But he actually said once, that if you need a new car, he said, pray for a Cadillac. He said, why is God going to give you a Volkswagen when you can have a Cadillac in the garage? 
Well, I'm sorry, that's just not gospel, guys. That's just not there. You know, but that movement went through the church and it attracted lots and lots of people, but it didn't change the world. The charismatic movement didn't change the world. The seeker movement hasn't changed the world. Matter of fact, some of the founders of the seeker movement that had these mega churches that made their services non-offensive to unbelievers came out later on and said, you know what, we messed up. That didn't do anything for anybody. You know, that didn't reach the lost. Um, then we've got right now the small group movement, which is very strong. And again, I'm not, I'm not downing small groups, but I'm afraid in a lot of cases, small groups are a place where people can come hang out with their friends and learn how to be a better mom or dad. Well, that's okay, but that's not changing the world. Um, then we've got the feel-good sermon movement which is also very strong right now. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to get up on Sunday morning, I'm going to tell everybody steps one, two, and three, how to overcome all of your problems and be a better you. Celebrate you and what you can do. That's not changing the world, guys. All of these movements that some have come and stayed, some have come and gone, but they haven't changed the world. And look, here's the thing. All of those that I just mentioned, they're not all bad. So now you can not attack your computer screen anymore or throw anything at me. You know, if I stepped on your toes. They're not all bad. There's good parts to all of them. There's some bad parts to all of them also. But here's what I'm trying to get at is that while they're not all bad, they haven't changed the world. Only the power of the gospel will do that. But there's been very little preaching of salvation anymore in the church. And, 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 and I've been guilty of it too to some extent, but I always, guys, when I'm preaching on things other than a salvation message, I always try to let people know, look, step number one is you've got to know Jesus first before any of the other things come. You know, Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10, he said, I have come to give you life and life to the full. Most of these movements that have been all about focused on everybody getting life to the full, and they've forgotten what Jesus said first. I have come that you may have life and life to the full. In other words, before you experience my blessings, you've got to get saved. You've got to accept me as your Lord and Savior. But we've gotten the cart before the horse, and because of our narcissistic, self-indulgent society, all we've done as the church is we've gotten into preaching about, oh, look at all that you can get from God, instead of preaching, look, you've got to have God before you get any blessings from him. So take a look at uh, chapter 2 again, and I want to look at verses 1 through 4. And look at what Paul says is the key to reaching people. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. In other words, I didn't come to you with my own devices. I didn't come to you with fancy words, with, uh, you know, all these contrivances that are going to attract you to me. All of these little catchy things that might get you to... To, to believe in Jesus. He said, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The heart of the gospel. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling, not pointing to himself, not pointing to what he could do, he said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, not the power of Paul to reach people, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. The power of the gospel is what he was talking about. The power that is inherent within the gospel message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. That's what Paul said was needed, and it's what's needed still today as much as it was in Paul's day. So it wasn't about Paul and his devices, but it was about the gospel. That's what's going to change the world. But I'm afraid we've been putting our 
faith and our time and our resources and our efforts into the wrong things. And we've, we've allowed the simple preaching of Christ and him crucified and risen again to take a back seat in our churches, in our attempts to reach the world. And I'm afraid in many attempts, it's not been uh, so much about reaching the world, but it's been more about growing big churches. And guess what? Big churches don't win the world. And I've been guilty of thinking the same thing. Because I've been through all of these movements in my lifetime and in seminary, and a lot of them I thought was the way to reach the world too. Um, I did a, 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 an internship in a mega church when I was in seminary, the fastest growing church in the state of Alabama. They were on the cutting edge with all the new stuff that was happening within the church. I've known people that have been involved in the charismatic movement, and I remember the seeker movement, and I remember all of these things. And again, I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm just saying, guys, they haven't changed the world. And the Bible says what will change the world is the gospel. George? Can you give me a quick definition of the word the gospel? Yeah, good, good uh, question. I would say in its broad sense, the gospel is the word of God because the whole word of God points to and purpose is to reveal Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings. But in a narrower sense and in the way that I'm using it today is Christ crucified and risen again because that's the heart of the whole Bible. I mean, everything from beginning to end is all about God's plan of redemption for humanity through his son Jesus Christ John 3.16 yep exactly yeah so while I think in many cases we've done a good job of maybe preaching the gospel in its broadest sense we've left out it in its narrowest sense and Christ died buried and risen again has taken a back seat to all of the peripheral stuff and I don't, and I don't maybe I shouldn't say peripheral because that makes it sound like it's not important it's all important and and the blessings that God has for us is important and how to be better moms and dads and better human beings and and how to overcome the enemy and how to live victoriously and 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 how to pray and and and, and all those things are all very 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 important but not to the exclusion of Jesus Christ crucified and risen again and that's where I think we have fallen short over the last 30 years is we've not given enough time to step number one. And that is if you want the blessings, you've got to know the one who gives the blessings. And that's by surrendering your life to him as your Lord and Savior and repenting of your sins. And I think we've got the two switched around. So that's why... Um, I'm starting this series, and I'm just simply calling it. And, and I started thinking about a really kind of fancy hook to the title, you know, that, oh, maybe that'll get more people in if they see this fancy name or wonder what it is, because I like to do that a lot. I've got a creative side to me. But I just decided, look, this is all it's going to be called is the Salvation Series. And that's why I was trying to encourage you guys to the best of your ability, get people in here that are lost get people in here that don't know jesus get people in here even that you may wonder i don't know if they really know jesus or not get them in here and it might take you being a little bit uncomfortable to do it but get them in here because their eternity depends upon it and trust me as we go through this series the devil is going to do everything he can to keep you out of this series and to keep you from getting other people into this series that's how he works because the last thing he wants you to hear or anyone else to hear is salvation through jesus christ because that's what changes the world not having a cadillac in the garage not hanging out with my friends not being non-offensive not glitz and glamour and computers and light shows it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, Paul said, for all who believe. And the reason he said that, or, or the reason that Paul proclaimed that is because he was not ashamed of it. So let's get started. Let's get into the salvation series. So let me start off by asking you guys a question. Why do we need salvation? Because it's 
atone for our sins because of Adam and Eve. Okay, to atone for our sins, Adam and Eve. Mark? Is, is say that it's once more. It's the life. guideline for our life, absolutely. Starting point, huh? Kitaya? It's the only way to heaven. Only way to heaven? Absolutely. Yeah. So, we can't do it ourselves. Ah, good. We can't do it ourselves. Okay. So the, the root problem, why we need to be saved, I mean, if, if there's not something to be saved from, you don't need to be saved. You know, if I'm, if I'm not in the water about to drown, I don't need to be saved. You don't need to throw me a life vest if I'm not in the water with it up to here to where I can't breathe. So there's something that we need to be saved from, and you guys hit it. It's sin. Sin is what we need to be saved from, George. <laughs> George, you're kind of getting me off track here. <laughs> well, that all depends on what your church tradition is. And that's a very offensive subject because if you don't get your way, you're going to pick up your toys and go home, as most people do. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, there are people that say that if you've truly accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll never turn from it. There's other people that say, well, just as you freely accepted Christ, you can freely reject Christ. But I will say this to you, all right, because I don't want to get people thinking about stuff other than what we're talking about today. We'll say two things to you, okay? One, you can't accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, commit a sin, and God takes your salvation away from you. That ain't going to happen. Christ's blood is what covers your sin. So you can't sin your way out of heaven. Christ's blood covers it. All right, the second thing I would say to this, and I would say this to people, I don't care whether they're on the side of eternal security or whether they're on the side of that you can, can reject your salvation once you've accepted it or not, I would say this. Here's what's most important, all right? I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what you plan on doing in the future. You need to ask yourself right now, here, this day, this very moment, have I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? And if you haven't, you better do it. I don't care what you did when you were eight years old and you walked the aisle. I don't care if you plan on doing it a week from now, a month from now. I don't care if mama and daddy built the church. I don't care if grandma bought you a pew for the church. I don't care that you've been in the same denomination or the same church all your life. None of that matters. All that matters is where do you stand today? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior right now today? If not, you better get him as your Lord and Savior. Amen. And I think we can all agree on that one. Amen. Amen. George. What, what does the word sealed mean? How does that seal? What does it seal? Can I stop? No. I'm a, I'm a, I'll answer that real quickly, but then we got to get back to this because we, we'll probably look at some of that as we go through the salvation series. We are sealed um, for the day of redemption, all right, with the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit coming to, into us as believers is God's seal on us that we belong to him. Okay. I'm going to get one I'm going to get one of those uh, light bars up here that has the, you know, the the green and the amber and the red and then, you know, <laughs> people know when their time's up. I'm just joking with you. Go ahead, Jordan. Go ahead. You can answer the ask the next one. No. <laughs> Did I, okay. If well, if the other one pops in your head, you can ask. Once the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He's there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you could do bad things, but He's still there, and if you ask for forgiveness. Yep. Absolutely. You're still there. Absolutely. George, yeah. look at it this way: you're saved. <laughs> there you go. I like that, Dick. Yeah, brother, you need to accept that. You are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Don't let the devil keep making you doubt that. Listen to what Dick says. All right. 
So, okay, so I think we can agree upon that. What we need to be saved from is sin. So turn over to Romans 6.23. Look what Paul says about this. Romans 6.23. Did you lose your glasses? All right. (laughs) So here's what Paul says. He says, the wages of sin is death. So let's hold it right there for a minute. The wages of sin is death. So in other words, what we earn from sinning, because a wage is what you earn, right? Mm -hmm. When, When you go to work Monday through Friday, you earn a paycheck. That's your wage, right? You get something for what you did. So Paul says what you get for sinning is death. That's why the wages of sin is death. So that's what we need to be saved from. And in scripture, death is defined in two ways. It has two dimensions. It's physical death, but it's also spiritual death. Physical death means your body is going to die unless Jesus comes back first. But other than that, your body is going to die, and if you haven't looked in the mirror lately, you'll see that you're in the death throes. No offense, but I am too. All right? All right, we're going to die. That's a reality. All right? And that came about because of sin. All right? The second dimension of death is this, eternal separation from God. That's spiritual death. Another way to put it is hell. Oh, don't say that word. No, hell's a reality. All right? So Paul says what we earn from sin, from sinning, and sin is this, guys, doing whatever dishonors God. So what we need to be saved from is the wages of our sin, which is death. That's physical and spiritual death. That's what we need to be saved from. The consequences, the sin and its consequences. Maybe that's the best way to put it. We need to be saved from sin and its consequences. So let me ask you guys this. What do you think about this whole idea that sin brings death? Just, that's just a generalized question. When, when I say to you, your sin brings you death, that's what you earn. That's your wage. Because you sin, because of what you did and do, you will physically die and you will be separated from God for all of eternity. That's the reality of sin. What do you think about that concept? Touchy subject, I know, but when I when you were reading this, it just kind of popped into my mind was like the death penalty because obviously, you know, killing somebody is a crime and a sin and the punishment that the law has decided for that in a lot of cases is death. And if you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior, then not only in that circumstance would you be physically dead, but also you're not going to end up in heaven, so you're also spiritually dead because you're separated from Jesus. Very good uh, illustration. You want to come on up and finish the sermon? (laughs) You couldn't hear that? Can you say that again real loud? Yeah. So I was saying the first thing that popped into my head was the death penalty. Um, because obviously that killing somebody is what you get the death penalty for, and that's a crime and a sin. And so in that circumstance, if you hadn't uh, accepted Jesus as your Savior, not only would you then be physically dead, but also spiritually dead because you'd be separated from God and Jesus because you wouldn't end up in heaven after that punishment either. What else do you think about this whole thing that the wages of sin is death? Is it fair? Come on, be honest now. Everybody's wrestled with these kind of questions. Okay, you think it's fair? What did you say, Dick? To God it is. To God it is? What did you say, Colleen? I said it depends on who you ask. Okay, yeah, that's true. It depends on who you ask, yeah. Because I guarantee you there's some people who would say that's not fair. Just because I sin doesn't mean that I should die physically and be separated from God for all eternity. I, I guarantee you, especially these days, 
out in the world. I guarantee there's lots of people think that because remember, the world today is all about me, elevating me. What do I get to have? And the whole idea of accountability just isn't there anymore. And that's what the wages of sin is death is, is accountability for what we've done. And the world doesn't want to have any accountability anymore. I, I think it was the, what a, a bumper sticker is I saw a while back, uh, and it was awesome. And I think it put it this way, accountability, get some. That doesn't exist anymore in, in society's eyes, but it does exist in God's eyes. What else? People would particularly say, oh, um, the, the spiritual death side of it, etern etern eternal separation from God, that's not fair. Matter of fact, I, had even, I even had someone say to me not too long ago when we were talking about the subject of hell, they said to me, and, and don't get me wrong, guys, the, the, the idea of eternal punishment is difficult for all of us to, to grapple with. But this person said this to me. They said, if I ever heard a preacher get up and preach that people are eternally condemned to hell, I'd get up and walk out because that's just vile to think about. George? I hang my hat on David. You hang your hat on David? Oh, okay. All right, you just keep, okay, good example. You keep that as a good example. right there you go you're okay george you're okay brother well guys here, here is my response to some of those kinds of things uh to other people's responses to the whole idea that the wages of sin is death is it really doesn't matter what we think is fair or what we think is real or what we are comfortable with it really doesn't matter. All that matters is what God says. That's right. What his word says. Who, who is it that said when we were first talking about this that, that God has determined the wages of sin is death? Who said that? Was it you, Dick? Yeah. He hit the nail right on the head. God is God. There is no other. And God has determined since he is the almighty, the all-powerful one, the one who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, he has determined that the wages of sin is death, physical and spiritual death. So it doesn't matter whether I like that concept or not. It doesn't matter whether I'm comfortable with it or not. It doesn't matter whether I think it's fair or not. It doesn't matter whether it sits well with my narcissistic, self-indulgent, and unaccountability view. It's still true. It's still reality. It kind of goes back to the example that Katea gave, is that you know, in places where the death penalty is, is law a, a an authority has determined that for murder you get the death penalty well they're just human authorities and people accept that we're talking about the divine authority of all creation the ancient of days and he's the one who said the wages of sin is death so whether I like it or not it's still a reality and so we're just going to have to accept that George? We're all sinners. That's right. Romans 3.23. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, if we're all sinners, asking for forgiveness for our sin, is that how we get saved? We're all sinners. We, there's only one person in every sinner. Right. Right. Yep. Nobody has ever been sinless but Jesus. So that, therefore, that means that what we all earn is death, and that's why we need to be saved from it. So that's the question we really need to be asking ourselves: is not is this fair or not? Do I want to believe this or not? What we really need to be asking ourselves is: okay. The God of the universe has determined in his sovereignty 
that the wages of sin is death. So how do I get saved from that? Because the paycheck's coming, folks, and I don't want it. So how do I get saved for what I have earned, Colleen? I never thought of it this way until just now, but I know a lot of people say, you know, it's not fair. Why should we die? Whatever. But if you look at it, God gave us a way to not sin. None of us could do it, but he gave us the Ten Commandments. He was basically saying, if you can live up to all this, then you're fine. We all know none of us can do it, though, so he sent Jesus. But I just never thought of it that way. Yeah. He did give us a way if we're like, well, that's not fair. And we well, chose fine, not live to. this way. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So let me ask you guys this. What are some of the ways that people, apart from Jesus, all right, and this is where we're going, but what are some of the ways that people believe they can be saved from the wages of sin? That, creating doctrine. Okay. Creating their own beliefs, their own set of beliefs. Ah. And if you don't do it right, then you're not going to be saved. Okay, good. So adhering to man's rules and regulations and beliefs. All right, good one. I see another, Leslie. Well, some people like keeping their Bible open in their bedroom or <laughs> taking a grocery. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some reason. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, that, that's good. I got to make sure that, that everybody heard that, especially that join us online. Is she said that by keeping our Bible open uh, next to our bedside, that's somehow going to get us saved. I guess maybe people think just through osmosis, you know, the truth's going to jump out of the Bible and into their souls. I, I don't know. Yeah. All right, good one. I hadn't thought of that one. Never heard of it. But hey, I I know there's everything and anything out there right now. Sue, do you have your hand? Okay. And I'm thinking, you know, boy, you wrong, you know? Yeah. Being a good person, then that gets you there. Yeah. Okay. Mark? Uh, now I go to Sue. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Sue. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Sue? And we're also supposed to be in community, so the people that think that they don't have to be in community mm -hmm. with other Christians, that's not true because it's one community. Yeah, definitely. That's that's one of the things that helps us stay strong, isn't it? Well, let me come over here to Katea, then Dave. Dave, i got to take my daughter first, <laughs> especially, especially since she had her hand up first. <laughs> Ah, okay. That kind of goes along with one of those little bit of things like uh, that. She said by just the simple act of being baptized. In other words, if I dunk you under the water, you're saved. Unless you do it differently and then it doesn't count. Oh, there you go. That's good, Dick. Yeah, unless you do it differently than what I think it should be done. You've got to be in a river and it's got to, you got to dunk your whole body in instead of just. There you go. Yeah. I mean, you think about this, guys, how silly that is, and I don't want to chase a rabbit, but if simply being dunked under the water saves you, I, I get saved every night because I take a shower. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, that water ain't going to do it, folks. You know, that's a symbol of what's happened, but that isn't going to do it. Dave? If, if the people know that Jesus died for everybody's sin, other people that might not say, well, I don't have to worry about sin and I can just go ahead and do it because Jesus died for my sin. Okay, so that kind of giving them a license just to do whatever they want, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, who, who, who was I going to take next? Was there somebody else? Okay. I was thinking if somebody else had their hand up. All right. All right, give me another one. The past couple of years, it has uh, really shocked me of just how unique the human brain is. 
and in particular how we can lie to ourselves to the point that we believe it. So, for example, well, if I say there's not a God, then I don't have to live by his rules. They just decide they don't believe in God. Yeah. That we can justify anything in our minds, yeah. can't we? Yeah. But before I look at a couple of these that you guys mentioned, because I know something that might be running through somebody's mind is, well, I've never sinned. Do you think there's anybody that is so self-deluded that they think they've never sinned? Probably, yeah. um, but you need to have a reality check there, Mark. Uh, Bible says, "Born in sin, shaped in iniquity." Yeah. That's, that's automatically right from the very start. Yeah, born into it. Yep. Yeah. And then we then we sin, so we're we're all culpable. Yeah, absolutely. So let me take a look at a couple of these so we can wrap up. Um, it, one of the things was mentioned. Um, you know, um, being a good person. Um, we're not good people, folks. We're sinners. That's the reality of it. You know, and, and here's how I know that, is that uh, Jesus said no one is good but God alone. No one is good but God alone. So if you're depending on your goodness, unless you're God, and I know some people think that, but you're not good. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. So we're not going to get in by our goodness because none of us are good. We're sinners. Um, related to that, good works was mentioned. Basically, um, I can earn God's favor by doing good things. Well, what does Ephesians 2.9 say about that? We're not saved by what? Works. Works. So that no one can boast. <clears throat> um if we were, people would be going around saying, look what I did. <clears throat> look, I got God's favor, so I'm going to heaven now. I'm saved because of what I did. It's not it. I do that. You, you do that? <laughs> I do it for a reason. It makes me feel good when I do, when I help someone. Yeah. It makes me feel really, really good. Yeah. And so I tell other people, so maybe they want to. Yeah, but here's the difference, George, between what we're, I'm saying and what you're saying, what you do, is you're not going around and saying, look what I've done, and because of that, I'm saved. You're going around and saying, you know what, because I'm saved, because I've surrendered my life to Christ, I'm doing this for you. Totally different. You're not saying you saved yourself because you did something good. Yeah. So, you're all right, brother. <laughs> George says it's been a good morning. Um, here's the other thing about that, guys, about you know this idea of earning our favor or earning God's favor, is you can do all of the good things that you can ever think of, and if you lived to a hundred years old and did good thing day after day after day after day, it still doesn't change the reality that you sinned. And it's sin that brings death. So you can be as good a person as there is and do as many good things as you can possibly think of. It doesn't change the reality that you still sin. And that's what brings death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Um, let me think, see here. i got one other, I think. Um, how about this one? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. Have you ever heard that one? Oh, a lot of people live that way. Oh, you hear the talk show host talk about it and people, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. Just as long as you believe. I'm going to pat myself on back and feel all warm and fuzzy inside because I believe something. It does matter what you believe. And Paul says that in the second part of our Romans 6 passage. Look at the second half of verse 23. Right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It does matter what you believe. The salvation is found in Christ. 
So if you don't believe in Christ, then there's no salvation. I don't care how hard you believe in what you believe in. I don't care how long you've been believing it. If it isn't in Christ, there's no salvation. What saves us from the wages of sin is not something that we can earn. It's a gift from God. It's not believing in something, but it's believing in someone, which is Jesus. You've earned death because of your sin. I've earned death because of my sin, but I've been given the free gift. I can't earn it. I've been given the free gift of salvation in Christ. So why is Jesus the one that you have to believe in to be saved from the wages of your sin? We'll find that out next week. And we'll look at the significance of the crucifixion and the resurrection on salvation on Easter Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me pray as Rachel comes up to lead us in our closing song. Father, thank you for truth and revealing it to us in black and white where we can sit right there and look at it, read it. There's, there's no second guessing, no wondering, no forgetting. It's right in front of us through your word. And Lord, thank you for providing the way of salvation, that, that our eternal destiny does not have to be death, physical or spiritual death, but you've made a way where we can avoid the paycheck that's coming. And it's because you've given us the free gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. And open our understanding, Lord, to this incredible gift of salvation and how it's all dependent upon Jesus. Lord, help us to grasp that as we enter into Resurrection Sunday next week. And Lord, Bring people in that need to hear salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this last song is called Lead Me to the Cross, and I just I just want to remind you that this week is a reminder to us that we are forgiven by Christ's blood. He took on the torment, the suffering for us, and we are so undeserving of that but we receive salvation through Christ Jesus. Amen. And if you need salvation today, please talk to one of us. Talk to Jim, talk to Colleen, um, talk to your neighbors, and I'm sure any one of us can help you walk through that if you need it today. Um, so this is Lead Me to the Cross. Um, I just really want you to listen to the words really reflect on them, and if, again, you need any prayer of any kind, please come see Jim or Colleen um, or myself after the service.
want to thank Rachel for giving that <clears throat> invitation, and uh, I'll be here if anybody um, needs to talk about salvation. And for you, those of you who are joining us online, please get in touch with me, and I'll be glad to talk with you about this incredible love that God has poured out to us through his son. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Invite someone to come and celebrate Resurrection Sunday with us next week. Have a great week.